Bueno, yo, yo nací en, en la ciudad de Chihuahua, sí. en, está aquí en el norte de, de México, en 1948. Fui el, el más chico de, de una familia de, de cuatro. Tengo tres hermanos, uh, dos hermanos y una hermana, la mayor, y este, vivimos en varias partes del estado de Chihuahua, de chicos, y me tocó estudiar en, en Monterrey. That's my great grandfather. His name was uh, Jesús de la Cruz Romero. You know, I, I've got my daughter. She's she'll be a freshman in, in high, you know, a freshman in high school next year. And I'm thinking back, my God, in high school we were hellraisers, you know. Why we're still alive is beyond me. We defied every every law, every you know, laws of gravity, laws of man, laws of nature. It's like, you know, why? And now that I'm looking back, I'm like, wow, you know, this. There's got to be a purpose for me, you know? Yeah. Being a kid, I didn't want to go anywhere else to school but where I, where I started. And uh, I just uh, didn't want to go anywhere. So for the first year, I commuted. I, I walked, I would say, to from Llano Camado to Talpa. That's about uh, maybe four miles, five, maybe. But in all in all, I, I think that uh, you can say we had a wonderful life to a certain extent. And uh, it was very hard, of course, yes. This is the deepest one. That's it. Because over here, the the, over here used to be a, a hump. All this here was a hump up so high. And it faded out, you know. A, a nosotros nos tocó la grandísima suerte de conocer a un profesor eh, con el cual estuvimos este, en su casa. Tenía él un internado en Monterrey. Al profesor Roberto, este, el profesor Roberto se llama el profesor Roberto Garza Zambrano. Y realmente fue un maestro ejemplar para nosotros. Mm. Y nos, era muy estricto, mucho, muy estricto. Ya, si entrabas de cuarto año de primaria, bueno, pues hacías cuarto, quinto, sexto y luego secundaria. Muchos se quedaron con el profesor Roberto también en high school, en preparatoria. Yo no, yo me fui al Tecnológico de Monterrey a hacer preparatoria y a hacer mi carrera. I used to go door to door selling things when I was a kid. Yeah. Christmas cards, vegetable seeds, you name it. It was like, 
know, it's just a skill I learned early on. I was a salesman from the get-go. You know, I did okay in school. I was an all right student, you know. Um, if there's one thing I could change, it would be that, to do better, do, you know, aspire higher as far as college was concerned, you know. I, I was the type of person that did just enough to get by, you know, stay out of trouble and get by. Whereas now I'm thinking, my God, with the knowledge I have, I should have gone further. I look back, I quiz people my own age from different areas of the state, went to different schools. And I mean, some of the things I was taught and some of the things they don't know that I take for granted is scary. It's like, my God, what happened? <laughs> I came back from the Navy, I just worked uh, building my my own house for about a couple of years. And uh, I had borrowed the money from my uncle to buy the property that I had. And I hadn't been able to pay him hardly anything. I just approached him right there and I said, I want to talk to you about something. I said, I uh, I know I owe you money, and I haven't been able to pay you. But you know what I've been thinking, and I don't know how. I been plan. <laughs> I've been thinking of uh, going to college. I said this is not there for the service men that they can help us if we decide to go to college, and I think I could. I'd like to try it, I said, but I won't be able to pay you for it until I'm going to school. And I thought he would say something, but he actually uh, appraised me right there and said, well, good, good. He said, I don't care. Go ahead. Education is more important and, you know, you'll be able to pay me later, so don't worry about it. Said, you feel like what you have in mind. So I got my BA from Highlands University and I kept on going to school uh, until I got my master's. I taught for 40 and a half years, different places. I'm a retired teacher now and uh, I've been retired for over 20 years now. Después, cuando terminé preparatoria, quería aprender algo de inglés. Yo no estuve en San Marcos de chico. Sí. Entonces, este, me fui un, un año a estudiar a, a Santa Fe. Pero ya me tocó en el colegio, me tocó en el colegio de Santa Fe. Posteriormente, después, tuve la oportunidad de ir a estudiar a la Universidad de Michigan, también inglés. Y luego ya me regresé a Monterrey y ahí terminé mi... mi mi colegio, mis cuatro sí. años y medio de colegio. Eh, mi papá ya estaba mayor y quería que me quedara a trabajar con él. Mm. Y cuando le pedí, que creé, le dije que quería hacer una maestría, me acuerdo mucho que me dijo, dijo, yo te la doy, dijo, dijo yo, te, yo te doy una maestría, dijo, quédate conmigo. Y siempre estuvo dedicado a cosas de, de forestales, de silvicultura le llamamos, eh, tuvo aserraderos, eh, tuvo fábricas de triplay, eh, fundó fábricas de aglomerados, que le llamamos, de particle board, uh -huh. y siempre estuvo muy activo en, esa, en, esa, en ese ramo, el cual yo también cuando terminé la escuela también seguí con eso, eh, hicimos eh, marcos artísticos, muebles, eh, eh, Casi todas las ramas de la madera las manejamos. This is my daily commute every day, Monday through Friday, yeah. And then in between I make a stop in Nambe, I drop off the kids. They go to school in Pawaka, so I drop them off at my dad's place in Nambe. They catch the bus and we're headed out to work. Yeah, my dad had bought this piece of land about 15 years ago. 
and it had been cow pasture ever since and uh, he had been wanting for somebody to move out here and take care of the land and um, finally got financially set to where I could do that and got established you know bought a house bought everything got it straightened out the hardest part was the utilities because there was nothing there so how long has it been so it's about two and a half years I'd worked for in retail for about <laughs> upwards of 12 years. I'd been a setup supervisor. I'd been new store construction. I mean, the whole bit. Basically, I'd go into buildings where they were just that, buildings, and build a store in about eight weeks. See, I'm notorious for being a workaholic. It's rare that I sit still. So I figure if I go back to retail, I'll go back to my 16-hour days, and I'll end up hurting my body. So I took a cooling off period of about I call it my four and a half year vacation. It's like one person that I can keep from going through things I've gone through. That's all it takes. <laughs> you know, that's a satisfaction. It's a lot like teaching. Early on, I wanted to be a teacher and I kind of like went backwards at it, started a family first and just put college on hold. And lo and behold, I've come full circle. I'm a teacher now. <laughs> Not necessarily in a school setting, but I'm coming in contact with people that I can make a difference with. And, you know, as far as the training program went, I, uh, I uh, took their course that they offered at the community college, got my certificate uh, for a diabetes promotor, and never looked back, kept going. We want everybody's test to be as accurate as possible. Well, my goal in life is to live to be 100 just to piss people off. <laughs> That's my goal in life, you know? If nothing else, that's all I want to do. And that's, that's my motivator. You got on, Alice was brought up with her parent, with her grandparents. She didn't know what her mother was because her mother was the grandmother that would brought her up since she was born. When I went back to the ship, I started, I, I used to write to her quite often. He used to write me letters from the Navy. And she would write to me. That's when we first, we really got into knowing each other. Yeah, we, we made it a dance because that time we, we used to go to dances. We were starting to go to dances. It's not all that time because grandma didn't let me go <laughs> too far. Until when I got back, when I got back to then, uh, Right away, we decided to get married. So when he came, it was just that he looked for me. And uh, I got married then, uh, not having, like I said, uh, not having anything, actually. Además la conocí en un verano en Parral y luego ya tuvimos la suerte de que, bueno, yo ya estaba en Monterrey y ella ese año se fue también a estudiar a Monterrey. Entonces ahí, ahí en Monterrey fue donde, donde nos conocimos y nos hicimos novios. Bueno, duramos de novios como tres años y en eso ya terminé yo mi carrera y y le pedí que nos, que nos casáramos. Fue en un, en un día de campo que hicimos y ya habíamos estado platicando de, uh -huh. de, de, de hacer formal, de, de casarnos. Habíamos platicado mucho y cuando salí de la escuela, le, le, creo que en ese día de campo le, le pedí que sí, uh -huh. que sí quería que, que nos casáramos. We met about uh, about 10 years ago. I was working at Sam's Club at the time. And, uh, you know, we lived together for about three years before we finally got married. You know, she, she was with me through my whole ordeal, basically. And, uh, you know, and in all reality, she really didn't have a need to be, you know. It was, 
had to be love because, <laughs> you know, anybody else would put up with that. It's kind of, you know, it's amazing. Oh, about a year before, maybe before I retired, uh, I had already been feeling uh, sick sometimes that I didn't know what was occurring. So when I went to the doctor there at, uh, in the hospital in, in Las Vegas, they, uh, when I, they checked me, they found that I had diabetes. So right away the doctor told me, this is the problem why you're not feeling so well because your diabetes are, are quite bad and I didn't know I had diabetes. Tuve un problema de, del pulmón, una infección en el pulmón y me tuvieron que operar. Estuve mucho tiempo en el hospital, estuve como 23 días. Esa operación fue la que la que hizo que se asomara la diabetes en mi vida. I was celebrating my 21st birthday on April 20th. On April 22nd, I was in the hospital. Um, basically what had happened is my pancreas had swelled to about twice its size and it was pushing up on my lungs. I couldn't take in a breath without my chest hurting. So I went into the hospital and uh, they said, well, well, even before the lab work came back, all I did was dip my urine and I was, you know, I had, there was so much sugar in there, it wasn't even funny. <laughs> they came back with a diagnosis of diabetes in, you know, a matter of minutes because it was that evident, you know. Mm -hmm. The doctor, my blood sugar at that point on diagnosis was over 560. At that point, the uh, ER doctor goes, well, how did you get in here? I go, well, I walked in the door and he goes, you could see it? And I was like, yeah, you know. My body had accustomed, had become accustomed to high blood sugars, and basically, you know, that was just living life for me, you know. Now I'm to where I get different kind of uh, reactions lots of times. Uh, like this morning, I thought I would be able to, it was one of these days. I got up, I had to go back to bed, got up again and again. Because I started getting dizzy, weak, and uh, once it gets real bad, I get it to where I get. Even my memory. What I do, I usually take where the, the diabetes uh, little machine and check my blood and see how high it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know that when I take it that way, I always score that it's much under 100, usually on the 50s or 40. And when you get to 40, that's dangerous as heck. And it happened to me. Now it's getting worse when he takes medication or his diabetics comes to a point that it goes down, I don't understand the low, too much. The low blood sugar. Low blood sugar. He's sometime don't know what he is saying and... And that's another thing too, that oxygen sometimes, uh, it's hard to tell when you really need it. Mm. But it happened to me sometimes that I... I can't catch any breath at all. I get up like, oh, here, what back there again, the anxiety? Oh, it was terrible. Oh, boy. Just, even here, when I sit down, I, and it wasn't the, the low sugar either. It was just breathing. He wanted to. Like you wanted to take off, you know, or rip your clothes off or something, you know. It's awful. You know, being predisposed to it, you know, being my mom being diabetic and being on my dad's side as well, there really wasn't a way around it. It was going to nail me and it did. 
the doctor came in. I was, I was at that point, I was receiving a whirlpool treatment with my foot. And doctor comes in and he goes, I've got good news <clears throat> and I've got bad news. I said, all right, give me the bad news. You know? And I, I really like this doctor because he was very straightforward. There was no, no minced words. It was, you know, he goes, your foot, your leg has to come off. I got real quiet. That's my nature. I'll get, when something serious is going on, I get real quiet. And I'm like, okay. And my brain's just going, you know, 100,000 miles an hour just trying to figure things out, you know, calculating everything. What do we do next? What's our next move, you know? And uh, got upstairs, and the first phone call I made was to my dad. And I told him, you know, the doctor just told me my leg has to come off. And he got real quiet. We're real similar in that sense. And his first reaction was, well, got to do what we got to do, you know? Um, next phone call was to my wife. And, you know, I started breaking down a little bit, and I said, hey, I got bad news. And she's like, oh, God, what? I thought I was going to have to take my leg off. And she started crying, you know? And I told her, hey, hang on. You know, it's not the end of the world. Let's, let's see where we're headed. Because from the get-go, when the wound started, <clears throat> that was discussed that of, as a possibility. You could lose your leg. So in the back of my mind, it was there already that I could lose that leg. Well, now, you know, truth has become reality. Creo que, que, que no me eduqué lo suficiente, sí. que no, no estudié suficiente la, la, la enfermedad. Uh, the beginning, I just tried to learn as much as I could from the from the, um, the disease. Next Friday, we always practice like some like bicycling or racquetball, and uh, he used to read a lot, and that's probably one of the saddest things that. He cannot read anymore because he doesn't see well. Es una enfermedad difícil porque porque no duele. The quality of life that you would like in your um, in your in your um, mature years, you can define it earlier by taking care of yourself, especially if you have. Uh, Diabetes. I thought the medicine was working. Hmm? What happened? Sí, cuando no lo vi. For example, here my ribs are not working at 100%. They work at 35%, 30, 35. Tengo que usar diálisis porque ya, ya mis riñones ya no pueden procesar todo. Resulta que tampoco sabía yo que, los, que el riñón es el que estimula ¿verdad? la creación de, de glóbulos rojos. ¿verdad? Entonces cuando te fallan los riñones, te vuelves anémico. Sí, vale. No. 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 Y tiene mis ojos, por sí. ejemplo, la presión de los ojos, sí, sí tiene mucha presión, tengo problemas con, con mi vista, entonces muchas cosas que sí, afectan los riñones, pero yo no sabía también lo que los riñones afectaban sí. en otras partes de mi cuerpo, entonces me faltaron aprender muchas cosas. Sí. Anyone that has diabetes has side, side trouble, and I used to go to those and a bunch of times when I did go, the doctors used to tell me, uh, you have a little diabetes there on the back, but it's not enough to get alarmed, you know. Thank you. I'm Yolanda, the doctor's assistant. Okay, in the past, what kind of surgeries have you had? For last year, I had a... Carotid? Carotid. Okay. The left one. The last one was my, my right eye. Cataracts? 
No. Or what was it? What kind of surgery did you have? I with? think that it was some kind of a swelling. Are you diabetic? Yes. Are you? Was it uh, was it with Dr. Tro uh, at the Retinas Clinic? Yes. Was it uh, because of di diabetes that you had that laser done or the surgery? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it was not only laser. He had already had four lasers. Four lasers? And so then he four had lasers. to have... And, that, and with, which eye was this? The right? Oh, the right. But right. he had four lasers on both eyes. Okay. But then uh, they had to do, I don't know the name of the vitro. The, uh, the, uh, vitrectomy? Vitrectomy. Okay. My first reaction after I got off the phone was, I could get dressed and I could leave. That instinct was like, yeah, let's get out of here, you know, if I ignore it. And then the other side of me was saying, okay, if we leave, the infection gets higher, it gets higher, we lose our knee, then we're really messed up. A family friend of mine, <coughs> I had known her since, since I was in high school, I used to be her gardener, I used to work for her, I worked for about eight years with her. And a um, real close friend of mine. You know, her first thing was, well, let's get a second opinion. And, you know, well, I said, all right, we'll get a second opinion, but I don't think an infection can change that much from one opinion to another. So we did the second opinion, and they, you know, concurred the leg has to come off. And uh, as to me, when I retire, it's going to be different, I hope. going to have all the time for myself. Well, it didn't turn out that way, really. It, uh, the retirement didn't, didn't turn out that way because my diabetes got worse. Retirement is not what everybody thinks it is. I loved hunting, fishing, and, and being at work, we all know that we always look at the calendar and holidays don't, are not forgotten. You know when, and you, 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 you make plans is long before. You retire and sometimes uh, someone just tells you, well, the, the 4th of July to, tomorrow or day after. Already? Here you're not even ready, you know, nothing. So, uh, you're not active in sports or anything of the sort. Uh, retirement is not what people think it is. It's not. Nos dicen en inglés denial. Mm -hmm. Sí. No me pasa nada, no me duele nada. ¿No necesitas el bastón? No, yo creo que aquí me. My wife calls this part, he calls this is. This is Chuy's kidneys. This is my kidneys. Yeah. Chuy is my, uh, my nickname. So this is, this is Chuy's kidneys. This is, uh, this is, well, it's a little over, but it's uh, about one, one and a half month supply. Okay, they send it to you every month. They send you all the tubing, all the solutions. You know what the, what's really, ¿Cómo se puede decir en inglés? The irony, irony. Yeah. the irony of this thing is that uh, your high blood sugar okay, uh, destroys or affects Damage. your kidneys, okay, the sugar in your blood. And now that I am in dialysis, Okay, that because my kidneys doesn't that don't function well. This solution is water with sugar. <laughs> and that's that's the way that they do it, I mean in order to pull all your toxins from your body. That's the dialysis. But isn't that irony? See? <laughs> okay. That now I mean you have to put sugar in your your body. You know, it's because your kidneys doesn't function. And basically they told me on a Friday and they wanted to wait till Monday for the amputation. And after the surgeon consult, I go, in all due respect, I'd like for you to take it off tomorrow. And he thought I was going crazy. And I told him, no, I don't want to jeopardize losing my knee. 
So I was like, okay, I'm gonna get dressed. I'm gonna go for a walk. This will be the last walk on my two feet. So basically I got dressed and I walked around the hospital, you know, round and round just thinking how, you know, what do we do? Where does life go after this? So uh, Saturday morning, they came, picked me up. Um, when you, when you hear about these prison, uh, you see these, these biographies and autobiographies, you know, the last walk before you're, you know, you're going to get, you know, exterminated, if you yeah. will. That's what it felt like, you know. Here I was, you know, here I am hanging with my butt hanging out in my hospital gown, you know, going for my last walk to the bathroom, and then we get on the gurney, and here we go. You know, and I was surrounded by a lot of family in the, uh, in the uh, room prior to going into surgery. And, uh, you know, um, they got around me and prayed. And I don't know if it was shock or what it was, but I was real silent, just watching, you know, trying to take everything in. And um, they came, and as they were pushing me down, you know, right into the surgery room, I'll always remember the cars were playing on the uh, music in the uh, operating room. Panorama. <laughs> that was playing. And um, I'll, um, I'll always remember, you know, that song was the day. And... All around me, I was conscious to the sense that they're setting up the room, you know. They bring in the bone saw and set it there, you know, they're setting up their tools. And um, I knew pretty much half the staff that was in there already. So I was like, all right, I'm in good hands. estaba en 200 con 100 ¿sí? cuando fui con María Elena ¿sí? en la noche estaba 114, 69 ¿sí? entonces es, son unas variaciones Poncho, enormes claro de peso cómo estás salí en 125. Más, ¿Estás es comiendo o no estás comiendo? No, es el bronca. No, no estás comiendo. Es que no puedo comer. No puedes comer porque te da náusea o qué es lo que tienes. Eh? Ahí en la noche obsesionado, ¿sí? recordando todas las comidas desde que estaba en la escuela. Yo. Todas las comidas que me y, y no, que realmente me, me te han gustado. Me gustaba, ¿no? y, y aún así no has tenido la oportunidad de, de concentrarte en comer algo, ¿verdad? Muy bien. Este, ¿Estás uh, haciendo tus tratamientos o has escapado algunos días? Esca ayer y, y en todo lo que tengo el otro un domingo. Perfecto, pero día más lo haces consistentemente. ¿Dolor de pecho no has tenido? ¿Dificultad para respirar? ¿Estás durmiendo bien o durmiendo de más? No, de, no de más. ¿Estás durmiendo de más? Sí, de más. ¿Duermes de más? De más. Ahorita la cosa es que me siento... Me siento débil, Poncho, o sea, no, no me siento con... Claro. Con el Entonces, eh, para... eh, haciendo comidas, haces comida una al día, quizás, si acaso. Ah, sí. Si acaso, yo sí, creo. Sí, sí, por... ¿Y qué cenas en la noche, Chuy? Este, ¿Estás uh, uh, bien orientado o estás confuso a veces? O ¿Te sientes... Uh, ¿Te sientes bien mentalmente, Chuy, o qué sientes? No, me siento... ¿Qué sientes? Me siento que no, que no estoy, que no estoy reaccionando. Sí. ¿Te sientes triste? Sí, sí. Me ¿Te siento. sientes deprimido? Sí, sí. sí. ¿Estás deprimido? Sí, sí, sí claro. Sí, sí, estoy. So, they finally give me the last uh, medication. I start falling asleep, you know. Next thing I know, I woke up and I had to look down. You know, was this a bad dream? Did this really happen? And now that I think back on it, that was the best thing I could have done, is to look down. And, you know, it's gone. There's no going back. Diabetes have taken over me. 
Yes. And that's what have me locked up the way I am. I used to depend on him and everything, but now I have to do a lot of things. Sometimes he, he doesn't remember from one day to the other what went wrong with diabetics is awful sickness. If it wasn't for diabetes, I would still be out there naturally. Yeah. Because sometimes I feel like being out there, but I know I won't. I won't be able to. The next day was some of the most excruciating pain I've ever experienced. It literally felt like somebody was wringing out, you know, the residual limb that was there. They had to mix drugs to put me down because it just would not go away, you know. Normal medications that would normally help with most people just wouldn't do anything for me. I don't know what mix they did, but it was finally pretty good. Every time I closed my eyes, it seemed like it was a different day, you know. Um, but the following day, they got me to stand up on a walker, you know, holding on. And the knee was going back and forth looking for the leg, you know. It was like, where is it, where is it? And I was like, what the heck is that, you know. And the physical therapist, you know, basically had me focus and say, okay, tell your leg to straighten out. And once I did that, <coughs> once I did that, it stopped looking. It was like, there it is. You know, and since then I've come to understand that you know the brain is a very powerful tool, mm -hmm. but it's a creature of habit. <laughs> if something was there and is suddenly gone, it doesn't adapt well to that. <clears throat> it takes a lot of time for it to change. Um, a couple of days later in the hospital, the surgeon came in because I'd been real quiet, you know, and he was asking, you know, what are you thinking about? And he goes, um, you know, he asked me point blank what are you thinking about and I go how I'm going to convert my motorcycle so I can ride it and his reaction was you're a sick man and I go yeah I am you know but I'm not giving up and uh, now anything can you know forget about it I don't even have energy or I don't even feel like going out and uh what for? I don't drive. I don't can go anywhere. I and to have somebody take me and they they want to go here, turn over here, go there. That's for the birds. You know, going is when you you yourself make up your mind and say, Shh, yeah, you know, that's just you know, that's going where you want to. Uh, you just don't come in down for this. Uh, from upstairs down, how to go take him his plate over there and and have have him have his meals over in in the room and, and sometimes he gets cranky but I understand that it's his sickness that's making him like that and he gets up a lot uh, most of the night. I see him sitting down in the bed, and I feel sorry for him. And it's hard for me too, but taking care of him is, is the main thing now, that I have to take care of him, hoping to get that no, nothing would happen more. And ultimately, Family is what pulled me through. You know, it's like, hey, I'm doing this for my kids and I'm doing this for me. And for a lot of people, that doesn't mean a whole lot, but to me, that means a lot. Just saying, even if I've only done it once, I can say, hey, I did that. And I've got some of the best teaching devices on the planet right here to show you why you should take care of yourself. What should, what should be your motivation? You know, if nothing else, to not reach this point should be motivation enough. But realizing your own self-worth plus the people behind you, who's with you, your family, whatever the case may be, your spouse, you know? You gotta be there for them. Give them that quality, a little bit of quality. Doesn't necessarily mean you'll live to be 100, but hey, Quite. try, fight it, 
you know, enjoy, enjoy what quality, what time you do have. Okay. Many gracias for having me. Many gracias a ti. Otra vez. Chuy. I think that a lot of people never think that they're going to get to that point where your dad is right now. Haz algo por el bien de tu familia en relación, claro, no estás trabajando o produciendo como tú dices, pero puedes hacer muchas cosas por el bien de tu familia mientras ella está fuera. Where I became more interested in, in dealing with diabetes and him. So it gets to the point where you get tired after so many years mm -hmm. because you're just trying and trying and the person doesn't doesn't take that into consideration. Estás, eres el centro de la casa, estás en control y tienes que hacer algo, es reparar la casa, arreglar el jardín, regar las plantas, puedes leer un buen libro, puedes hablar por teléfono, puedes hacer... Yo entiendo. Sometimes uh, the people who, uh, who have diabetes think that they are not affecting anybody but themselves and they don't realize that it's not only themselves, it's everybody around them, be it their, their, you know, spouses or children or uh, relatives around them, their friends, mm -hmm. their co-workers, you know, everybody suffers with them. Yo creo que el principal... Muchas la gente nos hacemos preguntas que no son las adecuadas. Por ejemplo, ahorita en mi situación cuando estoy con estoy apuntado para un trasplante de páncreas y de riñón. Cuando ha estado sucediendo todas estas cosas, creo que la gente a veces nos hacemos, o yo me hacía esa pregunta, pero mal, mal. Cuando, cuando dices tú, why me? ¿Por qué, ¿Por qué yo? ¿Por qué a mí? ¿Por qué me pasó esto a mí? Y la realidad es que estaba empezando a aprender ¿verdad? que no es fácil que la pregunta es la pregunta no es por qué por qué me sucedió a mí sino por sino que decir Dios mío ya me sucedió esto qué puedes hacer por mí para ayudar and I think that if I didn't have the facility that I have and the help that I have and my uh, financial system, the way I have it, I don't think I'll, I'll be as, as healthy because I would have to force myself to do something. And that's where people have to get worse, not the way about it. But I have, as it is, I would say enough help due to the fact that I have your grandma take care of these, take care of that. And then she gets tired too, and there's a lot of things that can cure my feet and all that. She, she gets to where I would say uh, it's too hard for her to do it because to put my socks and all that, you know, it's for her. I can see when she's doing it that she has a hard time. After so many years, you just, you know, leave one, one day at a time and sometimes one, one hour at a time. It's not easy. It's not easy and oh, you become a mother, a wife, a nurse. Uh, an executive because I, I, I work and I, I go out of town so much and it's not easy to just, just leave and, and think and just uh, not being able to be here all the time and even if I'm here not being able to get that message across that's the toughest part of it so ahorita yo creo que lo más importante para para mí también es 
cuando fue bien duro cuando me dijeron que necesitaba un trasplante y empecé a pensar en muchas cosas eh, de los trasplantes de, de, de realmente vale la pena sí. digo, ya es, pienso dijo bueno esa persona si me llega a tocar la suerte de que me toque un riñón y un páncreas no sé, espero que, que tenga una vida llena de que haya tenido, que tenga ahorita en este momento sí. una vida llena, una vida plena una vida completa sí. It's something that, uh, that you have to deal uh, with uh, one way or the other and, 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 some, and also you, you see other families who are going through worse times than, and through worse things than what we're doing that what we're going through and what we're living and I think that we have to see the positive things and all and thank God for all the things that he has given us and just instead of thinking on the negative and on the illness and all the what we cannot do well let's just thank God and be happy with what we have and what we can do. opinion my whole life right now is nothing but a success story I've taken some of what the worst life has to offer and made lemonade out of my lemons you know <laughs> yep <laughs> and they've been some sour lemons to swallow but hey you know that's just the way life is being a person with diabetes you must always associate yourself as being a person first because you are a human being um, It's, it, it's, it's always one thing never to lose the person. Do not become a statistic. Do not say I'm a diabetic because you are still the person with diabetes. Now, what you choose to do with it is ultimately up to you. The important thing is to always realize is there is no cure for it, but there is good treatment for it. It depends how well you want to work with it. that seem unattainable, unreachable, guess what? With enough time and enough patience, you'll get what you want. But it's not going to be the way you're used to. <laughs> 